if you have been programming for a while, you will be familiar with types like these ones. In many languages you have to specify the types of the variables you use, but even if you prefer imperative languages, chances are that you still think about your variables as being one of these types. But what are types, really? How can we think about them? One way to think about types is like a set of values. For example, we can see the bool type as a set of two values. It is either true or false. Similarly, the type int is a set of all valid integer numbers. For example, minus 9 or 7. In practice, however, an integer is constrained to a certain range in most programming languages. But actually, infinite types are not problematic at all. We can, for example, take a look at the string. A string is a list of characters, and that list can actually have any length. That is to say, there are infinitely many strings, even if you use just one character. So if we can think about types like sets of possible values, then would there be a singleton set as a type, so a set with just one value in it? And there actually is, and this is the type we call unit. So the unit type contains exactly one element, and it is denoted by this pair of parentheses. This unit type is actually the same as the void type you may recognize from imperative languages. Let's take a look at this example. So here we have a C-sharp function that returns void, and we return that using a single return keyword. We can define a unit type that is also a singleton value, using the standard singleton pattern of creating a static instance. And as you can see, we can then rewrite our function that returns void as a function that returns unit. And because it will always return the same instance of unit, we haven't added any information. These functions are basically the same. Another set we could think about is the empty set. So this is the type that we in type theory call void. It is the empty set. There are actually no values of type void. Note that this is different from the void you know from imperative languages, since that is actually a type with a single value, whereas void contains no values. This is an example of how we can define void in an object-oriented language like C-sharp. So as you can see, this is a class void, which only has a private constructor that is never actually called. Furthermore, the class is sealed, so there cannot be any other classes extending from this class. In this way, it is never actually possible to create a value of type void, which means that all the values of type void form an empty set. So if we can look at types as sets of values, what then are functions in this model? Let's take a look at some functions between the types int and bool as an example. Starting with the function is odd, which maps numbers from the set of integers to two values in a set of bool. So based on whether a number is odd or not, it maps to true or false. The other way around, there is a function that maps booleans to integers. So for this, each one of the two values in bool is mapped to a value in the set of integers. So what we can see from this is that functions basically map values in one set to values in another set. So values of one type are mapped to values of another type. A language that allows you to specify this mapping very clearly is Haskell, where you can define a function multiple times for different input values. So for example, the value to int can be specified like this, with two implementations for when the value is false and for when the value is true. So knowing this, we can say something about all possible functions that you can specify in theory. Let's take a look at some examples using these three sets of values. So we have void, unit, and bool. As we know, void is the set with no values in it, unit is the set with one value in it, and bool is a set with two values in it. So let's first take a look at all the functions that go to a unit. So from some type to unit. Then we can see that for every type, there is exactly one such function. Because there is only one value of unit, there is only one function that returns that value. We have actually seen this function earlier in the video, when I was explaining the unit type to you. That function was specified using a generic type parameter, so that once a specification could be used to define both of these functions. Now consider all functions coming from the type of void. And for this one, there are as many functions to another type as there are values in that set. 
So from void to unit, there is one. And from void to bool, there are two functions, one returning true and one returning false. But if you remember, the void set is empty. So we cannot actually call these functions because you would have to pass a value of type void. And as we know, there are none. So this function is commonly called absurd because it is absurd. While this function is of course not practically useful, it is very useful when we dive deeper into the theory of types. Lastly, we can look at all functions that go from the same type to itself. So a function unit to unit. There is one such function, namely the one returning unit. Similarly, there is a function absurd that goes from void to void, which you cannot actually call. And for bool, there are four such functions that go from bool to bool. So for example, the identity function that just returns its input argument, or the function not that returns the inverse. And there are two more, because there are two values of bool, we can make two times two is four functions. But why do we actually care about types? Well, in one word, it is because we want to know that our programs are correct when we write them. Of course, you could define an endless array of unit tests, but if the compiler is able to tell you that you are trying to multiply a number with a boolean, then you already know that your program is not going to work. So in general we use types to have some confidence that the programs that we write do actually work, like we intend them to. But there is one type of function that we haven't covered in this, and that is a function like this. One of the things this function does is print some output to the standard output of the program. Usually that is the console. But how do we model this in the type system? As you can see, the return type is just a double. But similarly, if we remove the logging output from this function, the return type would still be a double. So how do we know from the type system that this function is supposed to log or not? And that is where category theory comes into play. Using concepts from category theory, we can define a more elaborate type system that also contains side effects like these. This can then give us even more confidence that the programs we write actually do what we intend them to do. This series is based on the great book Category Theory for Programmers by Bartosz Milewski. You can find links in the description.